Well, good morning. Good morning. So the, the questions have all been coming this way. So I want to start with a question going that way. And it's a really simple one. There is no right or wrong answer. It's a matter of opinion. What one word would you use to sum up what you think is the trait of a great leader? Anybody, free for all. Courage, Courage did you say? That's a great word. Who else? Integrity. integrity, who said that? Over here, integrity. What else? Say it again. Visionary. Great terms for leaders, all of those, but as you heard from Brent, I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different. And that is what I believe is one of the most underutilized yet most essential elements of leadership, and that's hope. Uh, take a look at this picture. You probably recognize this from earlier this summer, right? This is the soccer team that was rescued from that cave that was underwater in uh, Thailand. But what you may not know is that the head of the Thai Navy SEALs said that hope was all they had to work with. And a BBC reporter who was covering that story end to end said it was an example of hope in action. And yet we all say, and I bet you've probably said this, hope is not a strategy or hope is not a plan, right? Anybody ever uttered that phrase? Well, I want to explain why I believe just the opposite, that hope is in fact a strategy and a plan. Not to say that you shouldn't have business models and plans, obviously you should. But when you understand the science of hopefulness, and there is one, then you will see that, that hope is in fact something that you can infuse in the workplace. Hope is about having a future-focused vision that as leaders you bring to life for others. And certainly your founder had that in spades. Look at when he founded the company, Way back in 1968, he started within one year a pension plan. And Carmen, where are you, Carmen? Just mentioned that you've got a very well-funded plan. That's not by happenstance. That was by design, by someone who was all of those things you said, a vis visionary, forward thinking. He was looking at how do I take care of my associates for the long term? He wasn't thinking short term, he was thinking about success way down the road. And then he founded your pension plan along with the profit sharing just a few years later. So he was setting up a vision for the future, even though not everybody probably thought of it at that time as this is the way we pave the way for others. And that's exactly what hope does for your associates. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can do that and what the strategies are, but you touched on your new campus today. That's an example of legacy for planning for the future living on. As you're looking at the space planning, and I'm sure there's a who gets what space decision still to come. I do not envy you that one. Um, but it's, it's a, an example of taking the best of the past, the legacy that you were founded on, and building that bridge, literally in this case, that bridge, that campus of the future. And that's an example of future-focused thinking. Now, the trick is, of course, to take your associates with you on that journey. You all know about the changes that are happening. You've been talking about this for a long time. Some of that conversation is much newer to them. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, is how do you bring them with you? Because as you heard, there's resistance to change always, but there are ways around that. And you know that you have to, uh, or Ed said, uh, success is the barrier. What did you call that? That was a great phrase. Su success, success, because you, it's easy, when you're a successful company like you all are, it's easy to say, you know, nothing's broken. Let's keep doing what we do. But in fact, what worked for you in the past, even what's working for you today, is not necessarily gonna work for you in the future. I mean, look at these companies that we all grew up with that were around, you know, kind of the too big to fail, but now they're gone or on life support, which is just another argument for innovation. And you've got your teams, it was so interesting hearing about your labs and your teams that are working and all the, all the things that are happening in mobility. The hardest part is changing mindsets, taking people with you. 
Uh, and um, I'll give you a little demonstration of what I mean because as, yeah, you see this, as human beings, we tend to dig in. We stay where we are. We fight for the status quo. Even when we think we're moving forward, that's human nature. We put our heads in the sand and we stay there. So I'll show you what I mean. Just do this right now where you're sitting. Just clasp your hands together and um, see which thumb is on top. And I wanna see how the room splits here. I've got my left thumb on top. So raise your hand if you're a left thumb on top person. Let's see, okay, now right thumb on top. It's about 50-50. I'd say that's pretty right on 50-50. Now try it the other way, and you might have seen that. That's a little speaker trick. Try that and see how, ooh, it doesn't feel quite right, right? But you can do it. But because this is the leadership team here, we're gonna up the ante. So I want you to cross your arms. Okay, now let's, now see, I put my left thumb on top, but I put my right thumb arm on top, so there's no correlation between the two. And it's, it's not about hand dominance, or we'd be about 90-10. Uh, lefties are always out of luck, right? Lefties in the room. Another space planning issue, because everything's on the wrong side. The, the lamp, the desk, the, uh, your return, your computer, your phone, right? You're one of those, you know, yep. All right, so now um, let's try this. You know what's coming, right? Cross your arms the other way. Just see how, uh, you're, it's not tucking in there, is it? <laughs> Suddenly, we're all doing the Macarena here, trying to get our arms to tuck in. Uh, it's, so, so let's see how we do. I was right arm on top. Let's see how we split here. Right arms on top, okay. Now, those of you who had your left, it, it, maybe 60, it, about 50-50. Okay, put it back the way it was comfortably. Phew. And now just look over at your neighbor, see if they're doing it right. Yeah, well, some of you are, some of you are. So here's what this means. Really nothing, except this one thing. This was a preference you chose when you were about three years old. And that's the way you do it, and that's the way you're always going to do it. But here's the thing, half of the world feels just as strongly about doing it the other way. That's when you're talking about those everyday risks, that's how hardwired we are to our own opinion, to our own behaviors and habits, to our own ways of doing things. We don't wanna let go. It doesn't feel right to us. But if you're gonna to move to the next level, it's all about noticing those subtle differences, which you all as leaders are more in tune to, but you've gotta notice for everyone on your teams, all of your associates, and get them there with you. But if you know a little bit about why we resist change, it's a lot easier to get to the how we can make change happen. So here are some of the reasons that we resist. The first one is just plain old biological hardwiring, right? We are, we're fight or flight driven. You know, as soon as we perceive something that's dangerous and our, our amygdalas of our brains, the most primitive part of our brain that is the least changed over centuries of development is our fear center. And when something is new, it can be danger or it can be simply perceived danger. That's how we're wired with negativity bias because as animals, as mammals, we don't have claws and we can't run like a cheetah. We've gotta be scanning the world for problems. And that comes up as negativity and results in that sort of fight, flight, or the other one that people forget is freeze mentality. So that's how we're wired. Change comes up in this part of us, it's that knee-jerk resistance. Fear of the unknown. This is the biggest issue for your associates, whether they put their fingers on this or not. It's that sense of ambiguity, that uncertainty, that overwhelm. What's happening out there? We hear about change, but we don't know what that means. So there's this stirring of emotion sort of right under the surface of something's gonna happen and I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, welcome to the new age, right? The, the ambiguity is never going away. That is something we have to learn to embrace and believe it or not, get people excited about. That change means opportunity for massive growth. It's not a bad thing, it's an opportunity. Easy to say, hard to do, but that's the challenge of leadership. Another one is just a basic lack of understanding and communication. 
And you probably feel like you've been talking about change and what's happening and what might happen next forever. But when you've said it a thousand times, your associates have heard it one time. You cannot underestimate how often you need to repeat things. If, if you remember the old days when we had record albums, anybody? It's like a broken record. You say it so often until you think you can't say it again, and other people are just starting to internalize it. It's really that critical. And of course, connecting the benefit of the change to the change itself. So people don't feel like, here we go again, or another change, we're doing it again. You've got to connect the dots for them so that they see where the change is meant to take them and why this particular change is different from another one or the last one. And then beyond that is to paint that picture of the future that people really can embrace and get excited about. There's a, a funny thing that happens, a sort of internal sense, almost a betrayal where we feel like, wait a minute, I've been here a long time and things have really worked well and I've been well trained, but now we're going in this different direction. There's a sense of, you know, was my training not serving me? Did my old manager, should I just abandon those things? And it's not about that, it's about connecting your legacy, the best of everything about the company and bridging that to the future. I mean, not a problem in this organization. There are lots who would like to forget their past and bury it and move on, but you can't negate history. In your case, it happens to be a fabulous history, but it's about the evolution so that people don't feel disloyal about whatever they've learned or whoever they've served in the past. Finally, and this is a very real thing that most people have thought about, am I gonna cut it in this brave new world? Do I have the skills? Do I have the training? Do I have the future focus to be able to take on whatever's next? But your group up here touched on this and it's so important that looking at people across that sort of lattice organization is really critical because the, the rock stars of tomorrow are the ones who are the lifelong learners. That is the currency. It is not, I firmly believe what Carmen said, it is not the people who walk in the door with yesterday's resume. It's the people who can adapt, who can change, who can grow, who you can drop in like a soldier in the field to different units and they're gonna figure it out. Those are the employees you wanna be looking for and embracing. And if you don't paint that picture of the future, you get this disconnect. You want to get people understanding what change means and more important, what it means to them. They want to understand, okay, I get that there's this big change up here, capital C, but what does that mean to my life? And as team oriented as you are, it's critical that you understand, and it's part of your JM family way, to recognize individuality, to meet people where they are. And if you fail to do that as a leader, you get disengagement. And you, some of you may have seen that Gallup poll. It's a study over, they've done this for 30 years, all 50 states, more than 80,000 people included in this survey that comes out every year with a, a pretty whopping number. I mean, that's a staggering figure of people who are unengaged, meaning they're kind of going through the motions, they're walking through, or actively disengaged, which means they could be making harmful mistakes, either safety, financial, uh, security, or simply spreading a bad attitude. That's a big number. Even if you're only 10% of that, because you've built this great culture, what does that 10% mean? What does that mean to you if you've got just a little sliver of that and how do you get those folks engaged? Because there's a price tag that goes with disengagement and it's estimated at about 400 billion, B billion dollars per year in lost productivity. Yeah, it's a big number, right? You're looking like, whoa, that's a big number. So the question for you as leaders is how do you connect the dots? It's not just a US issue. There was a study that came out of the Australian School of Business where they looked at 77 different companies and found that the one overwhelming indicator of increased productivity and profitability 
was the leader's ability to motivate and inspire others. And that's really what this idea of hope is about. It's really drawing on this emotional sense. I mean, we, as much as we think we make logical decisions and that our consumers and our dealer partners or everything is based on logic, we feel first and then we back it up with logic. That's what human beings do. We, we feel first and we think second. Now, we bring the logic into the equation, but we start with our gut and our heart before we get to the thinking part. And sometimes this results in negative thinking. And, and here's what it looks like. Ask yourself if you have ever heard this, I call this the immediate negative response, and it's that, that knee-jerk response to change or fear, where I mentioned the fight or flight, where you just kind of, either internally or externally, you just kind of go, Ooh, I'm, I, I don't wanna change. I don't want that constructive criticism. I don't want that future picture. And it comes out in our language. And uh, I spent uh, 20 years heading communications and corporate communications, media relations at Sony and Universal and Turner Broadcasting. So my background is, is purely uh, large in communication. So I take this very seriously. And I've heard now with the client companies I work with how language affects culture. And if you hear this INR, it might sound something like this. So ask yourself if you've ever said or heard any of these phrases. It might take too much time, or budget, or resources, or whatever you say. Anybody ever heard any, I won't say you said it, but anybody ever heard that in the workplace? We've all heard it, right? We've all said it at one time or the other. And here's the thing, it's probably true. But that goes back to the, so what? How do you transcend that as a leader, even if it's absolutely true? Second, we've never done it that way. Anybody ever heard that one? We've never done it that way. Hey, what we're doing is working. We're not gonna try something new. And even though there's so much change that's happening at this high level, what you'd mentioned, Carmen, and I'm, a, I'm a, a workforce and people person, so I resonate with a lot of what you said, is how do you open that mindset? There's a Buddhist principle called beginner's eyes. And it is really about coming into things, letting go of the bias, the skepticism, the cynicism, and looking at something with brand new fresh eyes, even if you've heard it before, even if you think you're not gonna embrace it, even if it comes from another direction that you didn't expect. We've never done it that way, or here's the flip side of that, we've always done it that way. Why change now? We've always done it that way. But both of those are deadly. You can't go with either of those because that's gonna leave you where you are and you're looking at the future. So listen, and I mean literally listen for those phrases. Weed those out of your vocabulary and that of your associates. And finally, there's the all-purpose fill in the blank. That's not how service reps, that's not how engineers, that's not how marketers, I've heard that's not how welders do it. Um, and I've got a question for you. What's your excuse? What's your go-to when it's, you know, I, I've heard the boss made me do it, or it's, it's our strategic plan is laid out that way. But I'll, I'll challenge you now, see if you can, can give me an excuse, a phrase I've never heard before. I always, everybody's got one. Uh, I heard from a, a large tech, tech company that you would all know, it's inside your computers, um, who said, well, we always say we don't have the bandwidth. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you are the bandwidth people. How can you not have the bandwidth? So we all enculturate these kinds of ideas. Anybody got a, a go-to excuse that you've heard? I dare you. No? How about I bribe you? I'll just give you a book if you, uh, you can come up with one of your, um, your, your enculturated phrase. Well, I'll just let you ponder on that. But just listen for those I and R's and see what you can eliminate from the vocabulary. Sometimes, you know, people need a little, little push. You want them to go with you, but they need that extra little push to get them there because, as I said, they, they're human beings. We are wired for sameness. And I'll give you a simple example. Uh, most of you probably drive to work, you don't have a lot of public transportation here in Florida. I grew up in Jacksonville, so I know. Uh, I live in LA now, we don't have it there either. Good for your business. Um, but think about the way you drive to work. 
If you drive the same way every day, do you ever notice, like, I know I stopped at that red light, but I can't really remember it. Or I, I know that, you know, there's a Duncan over here, but I didn't even notice it. Now, go a completely different way to work. What happens? Your brain fires. You see things. Again, it's the flip side of fight or flight. It's your brain waking up to newness. And that's what we need to do with people to give them that little extra push. But here's the thing, as leaders, often we know what the organization wants, right? You all are here to talk about what Brent and the EMT expects from you and what the company expects and where you're going in the future. Granted, it's a work in progress, it always will be, but what you don't often get to hear is what your followers want from you. Uh, the things that your associates, your followers want, you don't typically see in a job description. They are very different than the things that you would expect people to ask, uh, to, to want from you as their leaders. But there was an interesting study that came out of uh, two fellows who were former Gallup executives. And they called people, they call it random digit dial study. They called people randomly. The only requirement was that they had to be over 18. And they talked to thousands of people and asked two questions. One was, who was the greatest, what leader, what person had the greatest impact or influence on your life? Write down the initials. And they started with that because they didn't want people to think of Oprah or you know my preacher or my sports hero. They wanted people to be very specific about someone who has impact on their life. And then they asked them to identify three different ways that that leader touched their lives and left a, a, a lasting impact. And here's what that study came up with. And there were different words they had to sort of categorize, but here's what their followers, they took this research, they wanted it from a follower perspective because most data comes from a leadership perspective. So it was sort of looking at things from the other side of the desk. Trust, right? Foundational, trust. They also called it honesty and respect. Stability, security, or support. Now we'll get to some strategies about how you can enact some of these things in just a second. But here are the four key things people said. Compassion, caring, friendship, and finally, hope. Direction, faith, and guidance was what people said. So think about that. You don't often hear from the organization or from your job description, you need to be trusted and trusting. You need to provide stability. You need to be compassionate and you need to feed hope. I mean, that just doesn't come up. But from your associates, from your followers, those are the four most important things people are looking for from you. Now, let me explain a little bit about hope because there is a science and it comes from medicine and positive psychology. And the word hope itself comes from this old English word, hopian, that means to leap forward with expectation. And I actually think that's a great description for the word hope because it, it's that future that's, I'm leaping ahead. And it gives you that sort of buoyancy and a kind of excitement about where you're going. You're leaping, you don't know quite where you're gonna land, but you are leaping forward. And a couple of the pioneers out of this theor hope theory, as it's called, one is a fellow named Dr. Jerome Groupman. And Dr. Groupman was a Harvard-trained oncologist, one of the early pioneers in, um, in AIDS research. And he decided as a clinician early in his career that it was his duty to give his patients and patient families as much information as he could about their diagnosis, about their cancer. And he discovered that patients would shut down in just this sort of frantic overwhelm at that huge inflow of information. You've probably seen something like that when you get too broad. Not with everybody, some of your associates can take it, some you need to take by the hand and take them with you. But in his own sort of Kaizen method of incremental improvement, he then went to the other end of the spectrum and decided, I'm gonna give people 
as little information as possible. I don't want them shutting down because they're then not able to participate in the healing process. And they need to be present. They need to be part of it. If any of you have ever gone through a long-term illness or had a loved one who did, you know how important it is to sort of nurture and support them. They have to participate actively in their healing process. So he went the other direction and said, I'm not gonna give them any, any information or as, as little as I need to. And he discovered that people took that as a, well, no news is good news. I guess everything's gonna be okay. And that wasn't always the case. So he found that middle ground, what he called true hope. Not the false hope, the rose colored glasses, but true hope of this is the reality, but there's hope for the future. And he helped paint that picture with what he called belief, fundamental belief that change is possible, and then expectation. That's an expectation that what you do will create a better future. It's an expectation that is your actions as an individual, nobody else's but yours, that create that future. Obviously, you take those individual actions and you add them up and it becomes organizational success. But it starts with each of us. And an interesting study that was done at Baylor that uh, Dr. Groupman cited, it was on knee, arthroscopic knee surgery. I bet a few, we got a few new knees in this room, right? Um, 650,000 knee operations per day in this country. It's one of the most common surgeries there is. So at Baylor, they took these three groups and they divided them into, or one group, put them into three subgroups. Of two got actual surgeries, two, two different methods, debridement and, and lavage, where they just two different surgical, surgical techniques. And the third was the placebo group. And interestingly, you think, oh, I don't want to be in the placebo group. But of course, they didn't know everything from the pre-op to the operation to the post-op to the rehab was set up exactly like the other groups who had had surgery. And what do you suppose the long-term results were? All the same for all three groups, including the placebo group. But here's the thing. It was not mysticism. It wasn't that kind of woo-woo, I can do anything if I concentrate on it. It was science. It was physiology. And Dr. Groupman made a great point that it was the release of brain chemicals, uh, endorphins that raise your immune system and your energy, enkephalins that suppress pain. But it also came back to belief. The people that were, going, were in the placebo group absolutely believed they were getting surgery. They had no idea. They thought they were getting surgery. Here are these people in the white coats, you know, with the badges and the stethoscopes saying, hey, you're gonna have this surgery and here's what's gonna happen. And the expectation was it would not be fun. It would not be painless. It would in fact be really difficult rehab. They'd have to work at it. There would be some pain, but they would get through it. But imagine if it had gone the other way and they'd said, hey, guess what? You're getting the placebo thing. So, you know, good luck out there. That would kill that belief that change was possible and the expectation that it was gonna be okay. So it's very powerful what our brain does. That's not mysticism, it's chemistry. And that participation at that level is what really gave people that, that boost of, I can do this. And that comes right back to the workplace. I can do this, I can go through those changes. I can take risks on a daily basis. And uh, another doctor who was a, a, one of the pioneers, probably the first, in fact, he was the first in this field, was a fellow named Dr. Rick Snyder, positive psychologist at the University of Kansas. He was on sabbatical and decided he would, he would study up on hope. So he went to his research library to check out whatever studies, whatever books there were, only to discover there were none. And he realized it was because people had until then thought that hope could not be measured. I mean, it's, it's squishy, it's abstract. So like any good social scientist, he developed a scale called the Adult Dispositional Hope Scale, 12 questions to look at how hopeful you are. And it looks at your agency, your ability to say, I can handle this, I can do this, as well as pathways and, and how you're going to make that happen, how you connect the dots. And he called this, first of all, it was willpower. Do you have the stamina? Do you have the passion behind this? And secondly, and this is critical for the workplace, way power. 
And what he described that as, way power, is the belief that there are multiple ways to that end goal. That there, it are no longer in the assembly, you know, the beginning of the auto industry, with the assembly line in Henry Ford, you, you want to get better results, you speed up the assembly line. You have fewer brakes, all of those things. We don't live in that world today. We live in the information, the idea, even the imagination world is what we're about. And so it's really about having not one way, but having lots of ways to the end result, to the end goal. So as leaders, it's again about creating that, that hope-driven future and saying to your associates, it's not my way or the way, it, it's their way. Allowing them, and that is a risk for leaders. A lot of us don't wanna let go. That's the hardest part, I think, of leadership is knowing when to let it go and push it down. But as you begin to loosen the reins and let people take more risks, obviously with appropriate monitoring, more so of the, of the kids that are starting out and less so of those uh, who've had more experience and more time, but it's letting people have ownership, have authorship, have creativity to find their way to that end goal. That's what helps them grow as leaders. And that, of course, is one of the biggest parts of your job is building that next group of leaders. Here's what Dr. Snyder found when he compiled all his results from thousands of people that had taken that hope scale. Comparing high hope to low hope people, those of us who are hopeful, and I include everybody in this room, you wouldn't have gotten here if you weren't thinking consciously or at the very least unconsciously, subconsciously about the future and creating your own vision and a pathway for others to follow. We set more goals, right? Both in our personal and our professional lives. We set more ambitious goals than low hope people. If you don't have any hope that you're gonna get there, why make it that hard? But we high hope people are willing to challenge ourselves, to set the bar higher, because we have belief in our own abilities. We're also realistic and pragmatic. We're not making up nonsense. We're looking at things that are attainable, things that we can do, that we can impact. We have more success at reaching our goals because we've got the passion and the drive. We've got the willpower to go the distance. If it were easy, anybody could do it. When it's tough, you've got to stay with it. It's that level of perseverance. And it's also about teaching your team. You know, you try one thing, you try another, you try another. And then finally, I hope people have more satisfaction, less stress, basically more happiness in this challenging process. We like to dig in. We've got that scrappy nature where we're willing to take these things on. And when you can infuse that in your team, and a lot of it has to do with the trust that you build, they'll get that too, that they can try new things and even fail. So this is what those four leadership traits look like in action. And as I go through this, I really want you to think about what can I do to embody this trait? How do I link belief to behavior to make this something that I can see? And there's a, a yes or no. You're either doing it or you're not doing it. Um, so first is trust. And you know the basics of trust. You do what you say you're going to do. Uh, you, you keep your word to others. You, you, have, you hold confidences dear. But there's more than that. Again, I think it comes back to language and the precision of language. Think how slippery words are. I say something, you hear a completely different thing, right? Anybody who's got a spouse at home or kids, you already know that. I said this and you heard that, total disconnect. I mean, look at Wells Fargo when they said, cross sell, when at all costs. What did that do? Maybe that wasn't the right precision. I, I don't meant it or didn't mean it. It was not the right message to send because they got what they asked for. So it's really about taking great care in the way you language. Not to think that, not to be editing or second guessing yourself, but there was a great thing I learned. I, I spoke at a nuclear enrichment plant, which was fascinating. And they gave me a tour of this facility, which was was it was like the hull of a giant ship with only a handful of people because it was so automated. But I followed a team, two people, as they went about their daily tasks. And, you know, they're de dealing with uranium, so they got to be pretty careful. And one of the two on this, this pair that was just doing routine business would say, I'm about to X, you know, some 
handle some mechanism. The other person, that was the A. I am about to, you fill in the blank. The other person would say, you just said you would do blank. And then the other, that's the B. I confirm what you said. And then C, the first person confirms what the other person just said. So you're saying, I want the meeting to start at 4, and you need to bring that report for the X company. And your associate says, oh, we're going to have, we're going to meet at 4, and you want that report for the X company. And you say, yeah, exactly. See you at 4, bring the report. Now, I know that sounds like overkill, but is it? Is it really? When you are managing this accelerated change, do you want to say something to an associate and have them hear it in a completely different way than you just said it. Happens all the time. So think about that. It really builds trust when people know that they heard what you said and you know that they heard what you said. So it's that two-way street. Stability. Obviously, stability is being a rock for your people because with all the changes that are going on, they want to know they can count on you. You've got their back. You're dependable. You're reliable. You're there. But it, it's even broader than that. When you can, can really infuse a sense of behavioral consistency, it's not just setting targets and objectives, which of course you do, and you have to measure, hold people accountable, but it's having this sense of, we get it. We know what's happening. I could read you like a book. We could go into, you know, we can go into the foxhole together because we, there's a consistency of action here and deed. We understand the values, we understand the principles, and you've done so much of this work with your... But it's really something subtle, something in the ether. When you know you've got that sense of, I know your moves, you know? I, I know, I'm gonna move this way, you're gonna move that way. And when people have that sense, it gives them a great degree of comfort. They can relax. They don't have to be fearful. They don't have to go into it wondering, oh, what kind of mood is he or she in today? That's when people get off kilter, when they don't know what to expect. So be sure that you've got, this is not to say you can't be spontaneous and things aren't gonna change, but it's, it's sort of like the swirl of the hurricane. And as a kid growing up in Jacksonville, I remember coming out into the eye of a hurricane, which is so eerie. There's this whoosh around you, but right in the middle, it's peaceful, it's stable, it's constant. And that's what you wanna be to your team. Compassion. Of course, it's caring about your associates beyond the, the job place, beyond, you don't have to be everybody's best friend. I'm not talking about coddling them or babying people, but you wanna know them as human beings and you wanna embrace who they are as individuals. That's what builds a great team. Everybody, it's that otherness. You mentioned diversity and inclusion, but it's beyond that. It's knowing that your, your baby intern can have an awesome idea. Or maybe they'll have an idea that you've heard a thousand times and you know won't work because you've been here for 30 years. That's okay. Let them voice it. Let them, let them hash it out before you shoot them down. Embrace who people are, what their ideas are, where they come from. That's what builds that sense of real compassion. You care about who I am as a human being, not just as a worker bee or even a professional. Build that sense, and I'm sure you can think of lots of other ways that you can build that sense of compassion. There was a, a warehousing company that I worked with, and the owner there it was, it was a small business, about 500 people, and this fellow saw that his warehouse workers, one of the biggest problems they had is they were shift work, they were hourly wage, forklift drivers and truck drivers, that sort of thing. And he knew that many of them were just strapped financially. They were always paycheck to paycheck. And he thought, not unlike thinking about his employees' future, he thought, what can I do for them that I'm not doing already? You know, I had the 401k, all of that, all the company benefits. But what else is there to solve this biggest problem that my people have? So he brought in a finance coach thinking, hey, let's help them get out of consumer debt, put a down on a house, start a college plan, whatever was gonna change their lives in terms of money, right? That is really, you know, that's where people live. And so he knew there'd be some resistance because who wants to be the first in the door to say, oh yeah, I got 30 grand on my credit cards. That was gonna be a scary thing. So he found those change agents, it wasn't a questionnaire or anything, he just knew who the gutsy people were, who the ones that were first in line, who the ones that raised their hands. 
And he said, you know, Bill, Sarah, go try this out. Just give it a shot and see what happens, let me know. And he had a few people try it, and what do you know? They put their credit cards on, you know, they, they got their debts paid off. They started those retirement funds, things that they thought were so out of reach. And the word spread. They told one person and another and another, and pretty soon, everybody was marching into this finance coach. And it, the boss, out of his pocket, wasn't a company expense, it was just something he wanted to do for his people. That one thing, along with you know, being a good workplace and a good spirit and a real, it was a real family organization like this is, and I mean in spirit, it wasn't a family business, but people felt like, wow, he did something that changed my life. So it's that level of compassion and caring. When you take it beyond what people expect, it really hits them on that emotional level. They know you care about who they are, their welfare, not just theirs, but their entire families. Decisions not made lightly. Things that you've got people's lives in, in the palms of your hands. So when you make those decisions, it's they get that there was care and thought, even the tough ones. They know that there was care and thought that went into those. And finally, back to this idea of hope. And it is bringing the future vividly to life taking people over to, to see the plans of the new office building, talking about these changes. And there may be times you can't share every bit of information with everyone, I get that. Doesn't make sense logistically or time-wise or sometimes from a proprietary information standpoint. But the more you can share, the more you can be an open book, the more information flows up and down the pipeline, not just facts, but those soft facts, the sort of emotional truths of the business, yeah, I know you're nervous about this change, but it's gonna be okay. Come talk to me anytime something comes up that you wanna discuss. Whatever it is that you do that paints that picture of the future and connects everyone to it. And it's not the same for everyone. And your Family Way Leadership Guide says, you've gotta meet people where they are. It's the individualized, customized communication that is really meaningful. And you know this on a gut level, although I have some I have a client that I work with, and she's got an assistant. She thinks she should just, you know, just tell her what to do and be done. It's, it's a waste of time to be nice. And here is this poor young woman starving for an occasional compliment, a job well done. She'd do anything if she just got that little bit of feedback. Took a little turning of this client to understand you're serving yourself by being polite, I mean, basic polite is not that hard. It's just having good manners. But understand that it serves the greater good when you acknowledge people, when you build them, when you create that sense of hope. So my question for you is, and I mean this literally, how do you feed hope? There's no neutrality. You're either starving it or you're feeding it. And you get to choose what you're doing. There's an interesting, there's a book called Broadcasting Happiness, and it's about a media executive like me turned coach, and she's a happiness researcher. And she did this interesting thing. Well, I'll tell you in a minute, but it's about how you create that positive conversation. And you really got to catch yourself in those moments when you feel like, ooh, that's starv I'm starving hope. And there's a senior level client big client in the media industry who, you know, I had, I had to pry his phone out of his hand. And uh, I did a 360 assessment and almost every one of his team members mentioned, I can't talk to him without his phone in front of his face. You know how disrespectful that, well, you all know, so disrespectful. And he thought, yeah, it'll be a little annoying. No, there was a level of anger beyond anything he anticipated. He was starving hope by saying, I care about what's on here more than I care about you. And once he understood how people reacted to that, you know, he had to put the phone in his pocket, put it away, leave it out the door at meetings. I'm a big proponent of if you've got an important meeting, drop your cell phone at the door. I know that sounds really scary for a lot of people, but if you are tied to your phone because you're on deadline, because there's something coming up, send a second to the meeting. Growth opportunity for them, and you're not watching your phone instead of interacting with the meeting. But that's just one of my uh, humble opinions. Now, you've got to take who you are into how you lead and how you create that picture of the future. Because being authentic, being you, being vulnerable, being open and candid 
is, is a huge piece of, of your leadership style. And I know you've worked with this a lot, and, and I think, if I'm correct, you, you've sort of looked more at the what leaders do side than the how leaders do it, which is what I'm talking about today. So think right now about how you do what you do, and I guarantee there's something you do that is so special and so different, and you so undervalue it because you assume, well, doesn't everybody do that? It's like people who can sing or write or play the piano. They just figure, well, everybody's kind of got some of that skill, but they don't. There's something innately that you have as a gift or a talent. And I want you to think about that. You, you're probably too humble to have ever said, I'm so great at this, but now I'm, I'm inviting you to brag on yourself and not only to yourself, but I want you to turn to a neighbor. And normally I have people go get up and find somebody that they don't interact with so often, but Kim's already done that for me and mixed you all up, which I love that you, you're interacting with people that you're not sitting next to on a daily basis. So right now, turn to someone at your table and where are your odd numbers? See if you can find someone at the next table or just join in threes and share both ways. We're gonna do a couple of minutes. Just my leadership superpower Elevate it to that level is, and you fill in the blank. Ready? Go. So, how was that? Was it awkward? Anybody? Did it feel pretty good? Was it the first time you'd ever bragged on your own leadership talent quite so uh, vociferously? And I'll ask you just anybody in the room willing to share not your leadership power, but your partners who just blew you away with what they had to say, unless they kick you under the table and it's off limits, want to share your partner's leadership superpower to benefit the entire room. Uh, oh, here we go, over here. Here, Tyler's going to bring you a, a phone. Hang on one second. So will you stand and, and, and tell us your partner's name and leadership power? I have a broke foot, so I'm not going to say Oh, OK, in that case, you're excused. <laughs> Um, his leadership superpower was energy, and I sensed that as soon as he said it. So this is the first time that we've met and, and engaged, and I and I really felt that when um, you know in the delivery of it, and I can see it in how he converses with people and his interaction. So um, it's it's true. Energy. That's so. That's that. People do feel that they feed on that. Now let me ask you something. Anybody else in the room say energy is my leadership superpower? You did, there are two of you. Okay, but do you see how unique that is to the two of you? Now, people may have that in other ways, but energy, so powerful. Lean into that superpower because you've got it. You've got that sense of enthusiasm that is infectious. Okay, now, will you share your partners with us? Oh, of course. She beat me to the hand raise. Uh, she actually said visionary, which was something you had talked about earlier and the way that she described it, it made total sense because of her background and the diversification of things that she's seen at different levels. She's able to employ that with her associates that you know, she leads in different perspectives to give them the ability of seeing the big picture as they do their day-to-day -day activities. So it was very evident as well. Thank you. And, and you made visionary is that big word. You made it personal. You give them those perspectives having been at those different levels of the business so they can see the big picture. Thank you for that. Any, anybody else want to share? We have one more in the room or we'll move on. But thank you, appreciate it. High five, round of applause for you two. And I'm going to tell you about being, something about being the first to speak up. In, in studies, the person who speaks up first in a large group is often perceived as one of the best leaders in the room. So cheers to you for, for bringing your energy and your visionary spirit forward. This is so critical because it's true about you set the tone. Who you are, you set the tone with energy. You set the tone by sharing with your team those different perspectives. Social behaviors are contagious, right? We know that from a yawn to that great salesperson you've all seen who either consciously or subconsciously mirrors body language and makes customers feel at home and you get that immediate sense of rapport. We've all been, we've seen that at work. So I'll just, now turn to that partner again and just, let's just try it really quick. You don't have to move or anything, but turn to your partner and one of you, if they're two, just figure it out. One of you's an A, 
one of you or two of you are a B. So A's, your job is to stare right at your partner stone-faced, got that? Eyeball to eyeball. B, your job for seven seconds is to smile like crazy, go. Seven, that's it, that's it, seven seconds. All right, everybody. Did you see? Did you see how infectious that is? Was anybody immune to smiling? Did anybody not smile? Oh, you, stone face. Okay, we'll have to work on that. Uh, now you're smiling. No, he smiled. It's really hard. That, again, that goes back to just that primitive, we want to be, it's friend or foe. We're always kind of trying to figure out who's friend or foe. You smile back, friend category, friend, not a foe. It's that simple and that powerful. And as leaders, you are on stage all the time, like it or not. People are paying attention to what you do, what you say, and even more important, how you say it. Verbally and non-verbally, they are paying attention. I was mentioning the people that speak up first. There's something they, they, this writer, Michelle Guilin, talks about taking the power lead. And uh, in studies about conversations, she has noted through her happiness research that it is the conversations that can increase productivity, profitability, uh, add to the culture, but specifically the person that leads the conversation and then shifts it from talking about the problem to talking about problem solution. You light something up in not only your brain, but in their brain, and you can increase your problem solving ability by about 25% fascinating that you can do that just by saying, well, you know, this happened today and it really sucked too. Hey, you know, we had this challenge today and here's what I'm thinking. What do you think about that? And we know this, we know it intuitively, but you've got to catch yourself when you're starting to go down that negative path and turn it, not just for your benefit, but for theirs as well. And that's called the power lead. So think about how you start that conversation. There's a client that I'm working with at a university, and every time I call him, by the way, this guy is a brigadier, former brigadier general, every time I, so you wouldn't think warm and fuzzy guy, but I say, how are you? He says, fabulous as always. And I know before I ask him, he's gonna say, fabulous as always. And it doesn't matter what kind of mood I'm in, it puts a smile on my face instantly. And it's just that energy. You've seen it at work, right? You've seen it. You, suddenly you can take somebody and just turn them around. Well, that all comes back to your bottom line, to your culture, to all the things that you do on a daily basis. But here's the thing with people, as much as we're living in this swirl of change, change when it comes to your associates, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna happen over time. So you've gotta stick with it because time is limited and it always will be. So it's really about making fewer, better decisions so you can continue this acceleration. And if you don't have to go down the, dealing with all the negatives and all the you know, what ifs and all the, the problems because people have that sense of trust. They have that faith that you're gonna tell them the truth, that you're gonna be there, that yeah, it's gonna to be tough, but we're all gonna get there together. And guess what? It's gonna be exciting and fun they're gonna go with you. You're gonna accelerate the pace of change. And I've got one final little exercise I wanna share with you. Um, this is called a Daruma. I don't know if anybody's ever seen one of those before, but this little guy is a symbol of perseverance. I went to high school in Japan. I uh, actually went to six different high schools in six years, including two in my senior year, not something I recommend for you or your kids, but um, I encountered this when I was living there, as well as Kaizen and all of those great sort of Eastern philosophies. But this little guy, when you are about to embark on a change or someone else in your life is, you buy this Daruma at a temple or a shrine and it's, it's, kind of, it's weighted at the bottom. They're usually paper mache and they, they can fall over and they bounce back up like that little weeble kid's toy, you know, just bounces back up because He's the perseverance guy. You knock him down and he comes back. And when you get this Daruma, those great big eyes are blank. And you fill one in. And it's usually you give it to somebody who's about to go to college or get married or start a new adventure. And you fill in, you set your intention and you color in the eye. And then 
when it comes to fruition, when you've achieved that intention, you color in the other eye. And um, this is my Daruma. I've actually got him with me here today. He just kind of travels around with me. And I got this when I was 15 and came from a crazy family and background. And I set this intention that I wanted to have a happy family, a pretty house, and a good job. Pretty good for a 15-year-old, I thought, and that stuck with me for a long time. And when I hit about 40, I thought, you know, I think I'm there. I don't know, just, I'm just going to color in that eye. And I stopped. I did a little pinpoint and then decided, wait, that's enough. I'm not sure there's a there there. It's always this ability to change, to grow, that we're all evolving human beings, if we choose to be. And so I stopped. And I always think, you know, if I do it right, that last gasp, I can just fill in that other eye and call it a day. And so what I want you to do, to think about that sense of perseverance, of continuing on, despite problems and hardships and all those fun challenges that are going to come your way, I want to give you a little homework assignment. And so everybody who's on board, it'll take you less than an hour, I promise you, over the course of a month. And it can be truly life-changing, and I mean that. So raise your hand if you're on board. Or, you know what, even better, raise your hand if you're not on board. Anybody? Oh, great, all of you. OK, so here is what you've been voluntold uh, to do. You have agreed to that partner or partners. You're going to have one conversation once a week over the course of a month. So that's four conversations, five minutes for each of you. If it's just two, it's a 10-minute conversation. Three of you, 15 minutes. No more than that. It's not a text. It's not an email. Just make it short and sweet, and you're going to say, What's your idea to feed hope into the organization? What is that vision for taking your associates with you into the future? And the second question, what action did you take towards it this week? And your partner's job is to say, yay, you, you did it. You took an action step. You translated that belief into behavior. Or they're going to say, oh, didn't quite make it, even though you had good intentions. And they're going to give you a little kick in the rear end or say, how can I help you get there? And you're going to do that four times. And you will see how life will change, not just for you, but for everyone around you. Because you're going to infuse it with energy and vision and integrity. You're going to be a role model for other people. And I'm going to just wrap this up here with a quote from one of your founding fathers, a pioneer in your industry, Henry Ford, who said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. <laughs>